Now we're going to start our next presentation, which is called Why You Need a Healthy Pet Clinic and How to Build One with Miles Chadwick. Miles is the vice president of Emancipet New School, where he helps to ensure that Emancipet's expanding network of clinics meet stringent quality standards, advance the mission, and uphold the core values of the organization. Additionally, Miles oversees Emancipet New School, which provides training to outside organizations interested in it elevating or expanding their programs. So Miles, I'd like to, to welcome you and we'll hand the mic over to you. Awesome, thank you, Stacy. Um, first of all, thank you very much for including me. I'm very excited to, uh, to be able to participate in this uh, inaugural community CATS, our online CAT conference. Um, and it's exciting to have the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects today in, uh, in a medium other than I'm used to. Um, so before I get started with content, I want to say, uh, give you guys a little bit of background of just who, who I'm representing and, and why, um, why we know about this subject. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Emancipet, Emancipet's mission is to make spay, neuter, and veterinary care affordable and accessible to everyone. Um, we do that through operating um, high volume, low cost, and free spay, neuter, and healthy pet clinics throughout Texas, and we're open in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as well. Um, we've been expanding our network of clinics over the last five years, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to share with you today um, are best practices that we've learned from either doing things wrong or doing things right. Um, we're always very transparent about where we've failed and we we always try to use our failures to inform how we move forward and, and how we change our approach in the future. Um, Emancipet New School that Stacy mentioned that I, I work the, with the most is actually Emancipet's training program for other animal welfare organizations. If there's anything that I talk about today that you would like to hear more about, um, please check out our webpage at emancipatnewschool.org. Um, or just go to the regular emancipet.org page and look for the new school tab. Um, we do have a lot of trainings about the specific subject and there's a lot of information out there. Today we're going to talk about building low cost vet care clinics uh, inside your community. How to decide if you need one, step by step practices for approaching the work. I want to say really quickly before I get started, I want to define what I mean when I say uh, healthy pet clinics. In general, that at Emancipet means healthy pet clinics uh, to keep healthy pets healthy. Another way of saying that would be preventive vet care. Not everything that I'm going to talk about is exclusively preventive vet care. There are some things that, uh, that are super valuable that we can talk about offering that you might be interested in offering. Uh, but our, the primary focus is going to be on just the basics, preventive vet care, because those are things that you can actually launch fairly easily in your community and you can add to your existing infrastructure if you have an organization that's already either providing low cost bay neuter or sheltering um, or some other service to the community. Uh, so that's generally what we mean when we say a healthy pet clinic. Um, it's language that we use because it seems to uh, resonate and make sense with the communities that we serve, which I'm gonna talk a lot about today. Um, so what we're gonna cover today, this is a huge conversation. And each one of the, the bullets on the screen right now um, could, and, and in some cases does, have, a, have its own workshop. Um, the, when we look at, so we're going to start with talking about social change 101, which is really getting to how we think about this, the, the issues that we're trying to address and make to, in order to ensure that the solutions that we're presenting are the right ones and are going to be successful. Community uh, and location selection and community engagement, understanding the need and understanding the underlying uh, systems and, and infrastructure or lack thereof that have led to the, the perceived need in the community. So the reason that we think we need to launch these services. Veterinary outreach, um, building inroads with the veterinary community around you in order to expand your resources and ensure that you are uh, not met with uh, a lot of pushback from the private practitioners or uh, hopefully as little as possible. Um, service tiers and price setting. So kind of knowing what you can offer um, and figuring out how to get to pricing. Um, staff training uh, to ensure that the social impact of your endeavor is successful. 
and again, we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about what I mean by that when we get into social change 101. Um, but this is a huge, huge topic, and um, our goal today will just be to scratch the surface of each one of these areas, and we'll set some time aside at the end to answer any burning questions that you all have. If we don't get to something today, or if you want to really go on a deep dive on some of these issues, I encourage you to check out our website, send us an email, and we can talk more about any or all of these things. So, social change, what is it and why should we care? Anyone that knows Emancipet or me knows that we spend a lot of time talking about social change. We're kind of obsessed with it. Um, in fact, we believe that when we're doing our work really well, Emancipet is largely a social change organization. Um, we began offering healthy pet services as its standalone service in 2012. And part of the reason that we did that was to broaden the lens um, and, and expand the toolbox that we have for creating social change inside communities that we've been serving since 1999. Emancipet started offering spay neuter um, and, uh, in 1999 through mobile clinics inside uh, lower income areas in Austin, Texas. Over the years we've grown, we've added on more services, and eventually we realized that we were really focusing on pet owners who already knew what spay, new, spay neuter was um, and who had already made a decision to seek it out either for free or for low cost. In 2012, we made a big philosophical shift and strategic choice to expand our services to no longer be only for spay neuter, but also to expand our services to people who were not interested in spay neuter at all. So we offer um, all of the healthy pet services that we're going to talk about today to anyone that is interested in them for their pet. We offer them at a very low cost, and we offer them in the same communities where we've been doing low cost, high volume spay neuter for the last 18 years. Um, shifting towards a social change mindset has been instrumental in the successes that we've had over the years and in our ability to grow and to reach more and more communities across Texas and across the United States. So I want us to talk now about social change and social good the difference between those two and why it's so important that we understand that difference. Social change has happened when a significant and sustained transformation um, in societal behavior patterns, cultural norms, and values uh, have happened over a period of time. So when we talk about social good programs, um, what we're really talking about is programs that provide a service to a defined group of individual or group of individuals, um, could be people or pets, um, in the community that is, that is doing good work for them. One of the most, the simplest examples that we often use when we're talking about social good programs is a soup kitchen. A soup kitchen provides a free hot meal to somebody who is hungry. Uh, it, 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 in that moment, um, alleviates their hunger and and removes that removes that from them, but it doesn't fundamentally change their situation. It doesn't remove their hunger forever. It doesn't provide them with a new infrastructure to not be hungry in the future. It doesn't change their living situation, their lack of means. When we talk about social change programs, we're talking about programs that actually change the behavior of a group of people. Um, so one of the another really good example of a social change program would be Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mothers Against Drunk Driving uh, has been instrumental and incredibly successful in changing the way that Americans be, uh, be, uh, behave around drinking and driving and around um, other people drinking and driving. Prior to the 1980s, having a few drinks and getting in a car and driving was just not that big of a deal. But because of the grassroots, grassroots work that they did through the early 80s, which led to um, shifts in policy and, and laws across the country and eventually shifts in the way that we all think about drinking, um, now drinking and driving is a much bigger deal. And most of us would, would plan ahead and not plan on drinking and driving. And most of us would also try to stop a friend who had had uh, alcohol and was planning on driving their car. So that kind of, that's kind of a good example of a social change movement. Um, another example of a social change organization would be a, a, a low-cost spay-neuter clinic that 
charges a low cost, everybody pays the same fee, they have a website up, and they are advertising to the public that they are there. Now, early on in our work, we really thought at Emancipet that we were going out and changing the world for animals by providing low cost spay neuter inside communities um, where there were a lot of strays. And, the, and, I, and I'm certainly not making the argument that that work was not valuable and isn't, does not continue to be incredibly valuable and needed. But I think that the, 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 what we've learned over time and what the aha moment that we had about 12 years ago was that simply being a service provider it does not mean that we are changing people's behavior around spay-neuter. It does not mean that we're uh, creating significant shifts in the way that a group of people behave. It's important for us to exist as a service provider for people that are seeking spay neuter. It's important for shelters to exist as a service provider for animals that are becoming homeless. But the existence of those programs doesn't change the, the, the systems um, or the lack of infrastructure that's actually responsible for uh, those animals becoming homeless in the first place or, or animals um, that, are, that are in homes that are not seeking spay neuter. I know that can be, that sounds a little bit tricky. Um, so there are a lot of successful social change movements that we can look at, but interestingly, uh, spay neuter is a really, really great example. So spay neuter, spay neuter rates have increased by over 800% in the last 40 years. I don't know how surprised uh, any of you guys are by that. I was pretty su surprised by that number the first time I saw it. Across multiple surveys, we see that between 80 and 90 percent of the owned animals in homes, so we're talking owned dogs and owned cats, uh, are spayed and neutered. That, that tends to surprise a lot of people working in our field, and, and I think there's a reason for that, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before we start celebrating ourselves too much, I think it's important to realize that prior to the 1980s um, and prior to even the 1970s, only about 10% of the animals in homes were spayed or neutered. Now, uh, looking at, the, at that data that shows that 90% of animals are spayed or neutered, the thing that's deceiving about that is that it's across all income levels. When you drill down and you start to look at income levels in communities and the number of animals that are spayed or neutered, that statistic holds true in households that are making more than $35,000 a year. About 90% are sterilized. But when you look at households with incomes below $35,000 a year for the whole house income, that number drops to fewer than 60% that are spayed and neutered. Um, in fact, the lower you go in, in income and uh, in socioeconomic status, the lower the number of, of spayed and neutered animals uh, becomes. And when you reach the federal poverty line in the United States, it actually drops to 10%. Now that's interesting because 10% is the same number that all of the animals were at prior to the 1970s. So what changed? What, how, how is it that all of the, that so much of the United States shifted their behavior around spay neuter start beginning in the 1970s and over the last 40 years, and this one cross-section of the population was left behind. Well, there's a few things that are really key to understand about why we were successful in creating the social change around spay-neuter. Um, first of all, in the 1970s, um, veterinarians, a couple of veterinarians wrote papers about the benefits of spay and neuter. Because of that, veterinarians began to recommend spay and, spay and neuter more frequently. Um, and by the, by the 80s and 90s, it was commonplace for your veterinarian to recommend that you get your animal spayed and neutered. They would maybe have different ideas about what age or what other prerequisites be, than we have today. Uh, but in general, vets recommended spaying and neutering your animal, spaying or neutering your animal. Um, also, in the 1980s, Bob Barker began closing every episode of The Price is Right with this message of please spay and neuter your animals. It's a very sweet story. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the reason that he did that was actually for his wife. It was a tribute to his wife who had passed away a couple years earlier, and she was an animal advocate. Uh, she cared a lot about animal issues, and she specifically cared about spay and neuter. And so Bob Barker made that um, a goal for, of his and made that his mission for the rest of his career. Through a combination of uh, veterinarians recommending spay and neuter, 
the proliferation of low-cost spay-neuter clinics opening across the United States in the 90s um, and, and into the 2000s, and, and the messaging really getting out there, people began to spay and neuter their pets. In fact, when we survey pet owners who have spayed and neutered their pet, 60% of them tell us that they got their information from their veter veterinarian. The remaining uh, answers that were given tell us that people heard about it from internet in research, friends or family, or the shelter where they adopted. That means that in neighborhoods that have no veterinarians, where the internet is considered a luxury that many cannot afford, and where we know that 90% of the residents have intact animals that most likely they did not adopt from a shelter, people are, are probably have never been messaged about spay and neuter, and they've probably never even had access to it, uh, even if they had been messaged. So if you think about it through that lens, you might say, well, then obviously we need to open lots of free and low cost spay neuter clinics in all of these areas that have not had access and have not been appropriately messaged uh, immediately. And I would totally agree with you enthusiastically. But I would also say that's not enough. I don't think it's enough because if we're talking about impoverished communities that have been without any veterinary care for, for decades, um, then we're also talking about a pet health literacy that is far below what many of us take for granted and what many of us assume is accessible to all. And that in order to provide um, a real service to those communities, and in order to be really successful in those communities, we actually have to broaden the care that we offer beyond just spay neuter uh, and to healthy pet services and even sick pet services and emergency care and full service care. Um, we need to do this because it will, it's the right thing to do for the pets living in those communities. And we also need to do it because for every service that we add to our repertoire or to our menu or to our, our selection, um, we, we're opening up another door through which individuals can come to us um, and start to receive information about uh, caring for their pets and about, um, about, or about keeping their pets healthy and keeping their pets in their home. There's uh, some belief, although I feel like this is really changing over time, that people should be um, means tested in order to qualify for programs like the ones that I'm describing, programs that offer free care, programs that over, offer, offer uh, sub-market rate care for veterinary care. I think the reality is that uh, anyone who's ever lived check to check, whether it's because you were temporarily living, um, living in that, in, in living in an income bracket that was, that was hard because you were a student, uh, because you were in between jobs, uh, or somebody who's done it, who's lived in that, in that situation systemically, um, income, means qualifying is really just creates a barrier to care that we actually want people to seek out. Not many businesses would build a model that required individuals to prove that they were worthy of the product that the business was selling. And so I think that when we start to look at building these programs, it's important that we keep in mind that the best way to income qualify is to actually build the services inside the communities that need us. Um, if we build the programs in the right place and in the right way, then the right people are gonna show up and if a few people stray over from other populations, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, and we, it also takes, it takes us out of the position of judging the individuals that we're ultimately trying to serve. There's another piece I wanna to touch on here, which is obviously this, this conference and the, and the um, awesome podcast that's putting it on are really focused on community cats and cats in general. And when we're talking about a healthy pet clinic, low cost spay neuter clinic, full service clinic, we're not necessarily talking about targeting um, feral cats or community cats. We're, we're really talking about owned pets for the most part. Animals that are gonna be brought in through the front door by individuals who want to spend money on them. Now, some, some pets may, or some cats may come in, in traps or through community cats um, programs, but really there is a tangential benefit to the community at large by offering this type of care. Um, if you're talking about communities like I live in Texas, and so in Austin, we don't have this problem very much, but in a lot of other major cities in Texas, like Dallas, um, 
Lubbock, uh, Houston, um, even parts of San Antonio, there are, there are packs of stray dogs that roam the street. And so packs of stray dogs uh, lead to a more um, dangerous and obviously um, uh, volatile situation for cats that are living on the street as well. Additionally, people that are able to bring their cat in for vaccinations and spay and neuter and other services are, are increasing the overall, overall herd health of the cats in their community, right? So the more animals that we provide vaccinations to, the more animals that we're able to message about spay and neuter because they came in for a rabies vaccine or they came in for boosters, um, ultimately the more healthy animals we have in the community who are, are not reproducing and either um, jeopardizing the community cat population um, you know, through, through pre reproducing packs of animals that might prey on them, um, or, or jeopardizing those populations by spreading sickness, um, or jeopardizing the, the populations of, of healthy animals in homes um, by having them, them catch or be part of the spread of disease in the community. Um, so I don't know if I've made a strong enough case to you that we need to offer these services at a low cost, um, and that we need to probably do it without forcing people to prove that they're poor enough to deserve it, since we all kind of want them to do it anyway. But there's another study I want to show you that I think also illustrates the situation um, that we have right now. This one's really interesting. It just came out at the end of 2015. Um, and the ASPCA did this rehoming study where they came up with the data that of pet owners who had relinquished their pets to the shelter and who had annual, annual salaries of less than $50,000 a year, um, which is, I think, fascinating because it's a much higher financial mark than we've, we've seen in most of the other studies that we've looked at. These individuals um, were asked what services or resources they would have need in order to keep their pet. 40% of them, the largest percentage for, what, for, for, the, for in a single answer, said that they, if they'd had access to free or low cost vet care, uh, they would have been able to keep their pet. Another 30% said that if they'd had access to free or low cost spay neuter, they would have been able to keep their pet. And you can look down the list and see the, the other answers given. People were allowed to um, choose more than one answer. So obviously, you know, people may have said they needed access to free or low cost vet care um, and also access to free or low cost pet food. Um, and at, but ultimately, what I see is a trend of people want to keep their pets, um, but a lot of the, 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 the ideal care that we uh, say that all pets need to have is just out of reach. Uh, for even people that are making five times or four times the, the poverty level in the United States. Um, I I'm not that surprised by this information. To be honest, all of us working in animal welfare know what it's like um, to be to pinch pennies. It's not the most lucrative field for us professionals working in it. And I think that you know I've definitely had times where I would not have been able to to afford market rate uh, without with market rate vet care without going into a lot of credit card debt. So looking at this information and thinking about um, people who are making less money, who are maybe already in debt, who maybe are, um, their lives are in crisis for a variety of other reasons. It's not surprising to me that, that they felt that they needed more resources that they had in order to keep their pets. And again, for all of us trying to in improve the lives of animals in the United States, I think that one of the most important ways that we can do that is, um, through, is through keeping pets in homes. All right, so enough of enough of that particular mushy stuff. I want to talk a little bit more about social change and what that means, um, what it means to be a social change maker. What it means to do social change work is that instead of going at the behavior of individuals, which is, say, individuals do not make their dogs wear collars. Uh, individuals let their cats roam free when we wish that they would let their cat, they would have their cats indoors all the time. Um, individuals in a neighborhood, uh, a group of people in a neighborhood have ch not chosen to spay and neuter their pets for the most part. We're talking about groups of people and not the aberrant behavior of one or two individuals. But when we look at that, as social change makers, we don't try to attack or tackle 
the behavior that we want to change directly because the behavior that we want to change is actually the product of, as we just saw through those studies, it, it's often the product of underlying issues, systemic issues such as poverty or lack of infrastructure, um, historic issues such as racism and racist attitudes um, towards, towards people in certain areas. Um, so in general, when we're, when we're in undertaking social change work and we're using that lens to build a healthy pet clinic, we need to understand the underlying systemic issues that created the social problem in the first place. That means doing some reading uh, about the history of the town and the community that you serve, really understanding um, how things got to where they are, uh, understanding the cultural norms that perpetuate the social problem. Um, so understanding the community that you serve and how that community behaves in a variety of ways, not just towards animals. Um, and then designing programs, services, and messages to address and transform these root causes. So we're gonna build programs that are geared towards bridging the gap uh, in, in, in infrastructure um, and in messaging, not towards solving one or two specific behaviors. By doing this, we are gonna build programs that are going to be more successful in, get, in creating the, the social change that we truly wanna see. So coming back to, um, to wrap up this section, I wanna say, um, what do we stand to gain by offering low cost spay, neuter, and healthy pet services? Well, we know we need to reach the remaining 10% of pet owners in the United States who are living, um, living at or below $35,000 a year um, and who have not had access or appropriate messaging about spay and neuter. Um, we know that we can increase community pet health literacy so we can start to create uh, change that we all take for granted that took 40 years for us in our communities um, we can start to create that change in the communities that we serve by helping them have a broader vocabulary around the services um, that their pet needs. Uh, we can create new service seekers. What we know from the clinics that we run is that in the newest communities that we go to, uh, 75 to 85% of the clients that come through our front door have never been to a veterinarian in their lives. And an even higher number of those pets that they're bringing have ever uh, have never been to a vet before. So we're kind of we think of our clinics as kind of a gateway drug for veterinary medicine, right? Uh, we want people to come to us, you know, um, and and have such a good experience that in the future they it it they they want to seek out care again. They want to talk about the service that they couldn't afford today, but that we said was important and maybe next time they'll save an extra $10 so they can get that vaccine too. And when it comes to talking to veterinarians in the community, this idea of creating new service seekers can be a powerful tool. And then finally, we're keeping pets healthy and in homes. We're increasing the herd health of animals inside um, an entire community, uh, uh, inside um, either a section of town or an entire town or, or various place, places where we're offering services. And we're, we're hoping that, that that actually ends up with less animals becoming stray, um, having, having unwanted litters, or being relinquished to the shelter because of a sickness or an injury that they couldn't afford to treat. All right. So first, we're going to talk about some kind of nerdy data-centric stuff about how to select the community that you're going to serve. Um, this, is, this is pretty um, nerdy stuff. We could go pretty deep down the rabbit hole of talking about how to do this. Um, but essentially, the first thing that we need to do is realize that our gut feeling about our own community or the one that we want to serve, it's totally possible that it's right on. But if we're going to funders, um, and if we're going to the, the, into the community, um, and if we're going to partner with the cities and hopefully get them to buy into the idea that, that we're going to start offering these services to their residents, then we need data. We need data to really show what we're doing, um, that we've done our homework, and, um, 
And so, so there's this combination of, you know your community really well, you feel like people living on the east side are in need of low cost veterinary care. And so you want to uh, build a clinic there. Well, the first thing you're gonna do is um, start to look at that specific community as well as the zip codes um, and census blocks around it to put together data about who lives there and make sure that it actually matches your hunches. Um, at the end of it all, um, at the end of it all, you want to be able to justify the work that you've done and the and the clinic that you've built. And the best way to do that is to have a lot of really good data. So you're going to fall, use these resources to build a profile of the people and pets that you want to serve. Um, American Fact Finder, uh, I think that one's .org or .com, I can't remember. But if you Google all these, they, it'll come straight up. Um, city data, U.S. Census Quick fact, Facts. And then the U.S. Pet Ownership and Demographic Source Book. Um, the one we have is from 2012. I'm not sure if there's a newer um, edition of that. I think that might be the most recent edition. So let me tell you what each one of these links is going to do. American Fact Finder, City Data, and the U.S. Census Quick Facts. Those are all going to give you uh, information about the income levels of the communities that you're looking at serving. So I'm going to give you guys an example of uh, in Austin, Texas, where I live. Uh, historically, everything east of Austin uh, was the only er area that people of color were allowed to live. In the like eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, the city was segregated. Um, you know, this is this is a, this is a dark a dark page from our from the past of our country, and and this comes back to really understanding the people you want to serve. I had to do a bunch of research to figure all this stuff out. But when you come to Austin, there is a freeway that runs along the east side of downtown called I-35. Everything east of I-35 was historically about a black community or an African-American community. Um, it was also the only part of town where we put any of our sort of factories or water treatment plants or things that nobody really wanted to live next to. Uh, we also didn't have things over there like um, schools or um, uh, veter veterinarians, uh, doctors, basic resources, good grocery stores. Um, and so over you know, the last 100 years, the African-American community made that community thrive. They made it their own. They, despite being sort of given, um, given Get, having so many barriers to access to the things that they needed, they built this community and made it um, made it one that they could call home. Now, as Austin has become one of the fastest growing cities in the country, that area, which is very close to downtown, has become very desirable. And so gentrification is is displacing all of these families that have lived there for generations. Housing prices are soaring. Property taxes are crazy high. And so when we go and we look at that community, um, th there starts to be a lot of judgment because people that are predominantly affluent white people who are moving from cities like New York and San, San Jose and San Francisco for tech jobs in Austin will go into that neighborhood and they'll see dogs running off leash and they'll see underweight animals and they'll, and they'll have a lot of judgment. The reality is that, that that area of town was had no access to care for so long um, that, that there's just a very different standard of care for pets there. The reason I'm telling you guys this is in part to explain like the process of doing some research around why I might be seeing a lot of underweight pit bull type dogs off leash on the east side of Austin. It's not just because people don't love their pets. It's because of a, a history of racist segregation and lack of resources. But also, it's because um, in order to then think about where we want to have our clinics, we've started looking at certain parts of Austin where we don't currently have brick and mortar facilities to see if we might want to open a clinic there. We're going to use this data to look at the income levels in those areas. Um, from from the sort of the census and the American Fact Finder, we're going to look at the um, the at the median income. We we know that our clinics uh, tend to be most successful in areas where the median income is between thirty and thirty five thousand dollars a year, um, and where we there are areas that are close by where the median income is even lower. 
Um, we also want to make sure that that data lines up because of gentrification, because we know that some of the areas that are really close to downtown are actually no longer underserved. There are now little hip, full service, uh, mom and pop veterinarians opening in those neighborhoods because those neighborhoods demographics have changed very dramatically in the last decade. So there's an area in East Austin, Southeast Austin, that is called um, Dove Springs. Dove Springs continues to be a predominantly um, Hispanic and African American community. Um, it continues to, uh, it, houses, it houses a lot of residents in fewer homes than you would think, um, meaning that there are, there are multiple families living in individual homes in this community. Um, it's predominantly Spanish speaking. There are, there are a real lack of resources there. So one of the first things that we did when we were thought about potentially opening a clinic there, and in case anybody's in, in, in or from around Texas or from Austin, we're not doing this. This was something we looked at a couple of years ago. Um, we, we collected information about this community, which is sort of in the center of the map here. And this is a heat map showing uh, how much money people make in each one of these census blocks. So this is really important for a first step for us to understand whether or not there's a need. So in along the I-35 corridor, um, just to the right here, this is where we're talking about. And you can see that the um, the average income levels are, are under $35,000 a year for, for the most part. Um, so we take that information and we collect it. Uh, then we move on to create our animal resources map. So once you know how many people live in your area um, and how many pets they're likely to have, and I'm sorry, let me go back and, and say that, the US Pet Ownership and Demographic Sourcebook will tell you how many pets on average um, people have in your state. So it's, a, it's the best way that we've found to come up with an, a guesstimate at how many animals there are in an area in need. So once you've built your source, once you've built your map that shows you how many people are in an area and how much money they make, and you feel pretty good about the the income or the the income levels being appropriate for being able to support your clinic, but also being able to to target the right clients. You also want to look and see how many pets are likely to live in that area. So now that you have that information, you know how many pets there are, you know how many people there are, you know roughly how much money people are going to have. Um, you're going to use Google, the Vet Finder app, and Batch Geo to build a map that tells you what animal resources exist in the community. Um, this is going to include pet stores, full service veterinarians, emergency veterinarians, wellness only clinics, animal shelters, and anywhere where people are being able to purchase um, goods for their food so or goods for their for their pets so in some communities that they might be buying their food at the dollar general it's pretty common actually in a lot of the lower income communities that we visit that they're either in in urban cities they're buying pet food at, at discount stores like dollar general and in more rural areas or, par or parts of um, texas they're buying it at a at a feed supply or a tractor store um, you're going to use all of the data that you pull up to build a map that shows the area that you have and all the resources that are located in and around it. So here's what's interesting. This is the Dove Springs area in which we were looking at potentially opening a clinic. There's not a single veterinarian um, or pet store in that entire area. So it's not surprising, right? This really supports the ideas that I, I was kind of talking about. This supports what we suspected was true. But now we have a really, really strong leg to stand on when it comes to justifying why we are going to open a clinic in an area um, and why we're not going to income qualify for that clinic. What we can see is that people in that area have, do not have access to care. Um, people in that area are making low enough salaries that in general, many of them don't, may not have cars, may not have the ability to travel uh, to another location, to a veterinarian that's just outside of their area. Um, and because they've never had access to care, they're going to need a lot of, of special programs and handholding to make sure that the messages are given in just the right way. All right. So that's the sort of scratching the surface on picking the area where you're going to put your clinic. I expect questions on all this stuff. Uh, I know it's kind of fast. All right. 
So community engagement. At Emancipet, we're big believers in something called design thinking. This process has its roots in for-profit marketing, and at its core, it means designing a product that someone is more likely to want or buy because it was designed to meet their specific needs or wants. Um, the alternative would be designing a program or service or opening a store or clinic in an area where no one is seeking that service um, and crossing your fingers and hoping that you can talk people into wanting or needing what you have to sell. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I guess the old model would be, I have a service, how can I can convince people to take advantage of it? And the design thinking approach would say, how can I design a service that the people who I want to serve would be, would be likely um, to buy into? How can I des design a service that meets the needs of the community that I want to serve? Uh, it's, 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 it may sound nuanced, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty big difference. Um, utilizing this method of community engagement or assessment is really key, and I cannot stress enough that you can't skip it. We have skipped it before. I'm speaking from experience. Um, skipping this step means skipping an opportunity to hear things from the community that can fundamentally change the way you approach the work and can make you infinitely more successful. I'm not saying that you can't strike gold without doing this step and just you know land on the right message and the right services, but it's pretty unlikely. What we've seen in the communities that we serve is that by, by engaging in, uh, in human-centered design and in design thinking, um, our com the community buys into our messaging faster um, and are, they're really appreciative of, of being involved in the process as well. There's a few different methods that we use um, to do this. So the idea of, of design thinking is listen, create, deliver. Um, this little model right here. So listen means you, you engage the community directly and, and hear their voices, opinions, and ideas about what it is to live in that community. If we're talking about pet services, some of those, some of that will be learning about what it is to have a pet in that community, but it shouldn't be exclusively about that. It, it needs to be bigger picture. It needs to be about things like religion and school and family, um, transportation, rent, all of the things that are part of living in a community, um, including, including the animals that they, that they keep. Um, and certainly there's a piece of this could, that could uh, touch on community cats and how they're viewed in those, in those communities. The next piece is that you create um, or prototype a program that you think will uh, meet the need based on all the information you gathered from your listening and you try it and, you, and if it fails, you tweak it and you go back to listen and you kind of keep going back and forth until you get something that works really well and then you finally scale it, and that's the deliver part. Um, so there's a few methods for doing this, um, and I'll tell you a brief example of, of how, uh, how we've done this and, and how, how we, one of the ways that we decided this is so important to do and how it could influence the services that we have. Door-to-door um, -door conversations are a really, really great way to do it. Honestly, you cannot design programs for people that you don't meet face to face and talk to, um, especially in a field that we tend to be from different backgrounds than the communities that we serve. We're not going to build the best programs sitting in our offices or in our shelters or in our homes together talking about wouldn't it be great. The way we're going to build these programs is by going out and talking to the people. So door to door programs are key. Um, if you have an existing service, so say you're already doing low cost spay neuter or you have a shelter. Um, or whatever else it is, you can use your waiting room as a listening waiting room. So having mechanisms for actually gathering data from the individuals that come to uh, take advantage of your services already um, and see and if, if those people represent the community that you want to add services for, then listening to them and surveying them um, is really key. Attending community and neighborhood meetings, church meetings, et cetera, and listening to the concerns of people in the community. Um, and then the IDEA workbook. And ide the IDEA workbook is just the most amazing thing. It's a tremendous resource and it's totally free and you can download it from IDEO, I-D-E-O dot um, org. Uh, in order to make sure that you are not duplicating efforts, you also are gonna wanna make sure that 
you're want to get you're going to want to get a lay of the land for what other organizations are are in that community already doing work and look for opportunities to partner. Um, so I told you I would give you an example. This family in the in the picture that um, that is on the screen right now it lives in Houston, Texas. Um, this is part of a series of photos that we're doing of our clients and their pets um, at their homes. And it's just a nice picture to, to put on the screen while I talk about what happened when we first got to Houston. So we had done some work uh, around designing services and we knew kind of what we were gonna do. We were gonna offer low cost and free spay neuter. We were gonna offer um, low cost wellness services in the east, to the east end um, of Houston, Texas. And when, before we got our doors open, uh, myself and our and our outreach strategies manager Matt Pacone went down to Houston and spent a few weeks just walking the streets, um, knocking on doors. I wear a Fitbit and I think I was getting about forty thousand steps a day. So if that gives you any sense for those of you that are that wear pedometers or Fitbits, you kind of kind of know there's a lot of walking and a lot of talking and a lot of knocking on doors. And we really just asked people about their pets. We let them know that we were coming. But we kind of asked just a handful of questions and then let the conversations go where they will. Sometimes we talk to people for two minutes. Sometimes we talk to people for 45 minutes to an hour. We really just wanted to get to know the community that we were going to be serving. One of the interesting things that came up again and again and again that I never led with and I never tried to leave pe lead people to was people asked us if we would be offering low-cost grooming. It turns out that there were just a lot of individuals living in some of these neighborhoods immediately around where our clinic was opening that had smaller breed dogs that actually require grooming and there were no affordable options within, uh, within a 20 minute drive of that neighborhood. Um, that's something that we never would have thought about. And now it's, and, and I'll be perfectly transparent, we're not offering that service. It's not something that we have figured out how to offer yet. But it is something that we that is on our list, our checklist for that community. And honestly, what if we had done that work a year earlier? What if we had gone down there and as, and done had those conversations earlier than we did? We we might have actually been able to launch with that particular product or service in place, and we probably would have been more successful more quickly in that community. So this is just one example of one service that might have brought people into our clinic who weren't seeking any of the other things that we have to offer, but who would benefit from them ultimately, and who would have been exposed to the message because they came for this one thing that they knew they needed, which was affordable grooming. All right, now we get to talk about the thing that I get calls about from uh, vet clinics and shelters and spay neuter clinics all over the country all the time, which is private practice vets are gonna shut us down if we don't uh, income qualify or if we offer services that they offer or you know insert fear here so I want to say um, a few things about this this particular subject because it's something that I think we all struggle with in animal welfare um, I think it's something that we often can get really um, we can get really wrapped around the axle and and sort of scared of of private practice veterinarians and of their um, of their their control over us. Um, and so the first piece of this I want to say is just in general, I think we need to have more empathy for veterinarians, um, private practice or otherwise. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have come out in the last uh, seven years showing that stress um, that the the stress that private practice veterinarians, are under to actually keep their doors open is is pretty incredible. Um, in in 2013, the New York Times reported that uh, the meeting sal the median median salary um, of somebody leaving vet school uh, was was about sixty three thousand per dollars per year, whereas they were leaving debt um, with roughly they were leaving school with roughly, I think, uh, $300,000 in debt, something like that. Um, you should look up the report. Sorry, I'm fudging the numbers on that. I actually just can't read my handwriting. Uh, in, in 2015, the AVMA uh, put out a report saying that one in six vets have considered suicide. 
That's three times the national mean. And in 2013, AVMA um, put out this workforce report because they wanted to make a case for why we needed more veterinarians. They were actually super surprised when they realized uh, after doing the research and the surveys that 12.5% of the existing capacity in 2013 of veterinarians was not being used. What that means is there's actually, there, there, the, the existing workforce in 2013, which has grown significantly since then, was already not finding enough work, was already not having enough clients coming through the door with their pets. And every year we're graduating more vets than we were before. Vet school is more expensive than medical school at this point in some cases. And vets are, are entering the workforce with debts that they will be lucky to ever pay off. So. Having some empathy for veterinarians, I think we also need to look at them as possible partners um, and allies. Oftentimes, veterinarians, um, the concerns that we think that we're going to hear or that we do hear from, from veterinarians are that we have, uh, we get tax breaks that they don't get, that we offer substandard care, um, and that we receive exclusive discounts, and that we're stealing clients. Those are kind of the biggest ones that I hear, and I think we need to be able to address those things. Um, honestly, we still pay taxes. We still pay some sales tax. We tax. We pay pay property tax. We pay employment tax. We're not just like rolling in the dough over here. The biggest difference is that uh, the, one of the biggest differences is really that we can we can we can ask for donations, but really having a, a good fundraising strategy means hiring somebody and paying them to be a fundraiser. Um, and veterinarians, if they really want, they can make their own not-for-profit too, if they feel like those are unfair advantages. The idea that we offer substandard care, uh, honestly, we just have to not ever offer substandard care. We have, to, we have to make sure that we're meeting or exceeding the guidelines for every, every type of service that we offer. Um, we need to see our own mistakes. Um, and we need to, you know, make sure that we're always looking to to create transformative experiences for clients coming to our clinics. Uh, most there are shelter discount programs for for vet clinics, but the reality is that the way that we get most of our discounts is through volume, because we do, most of us use high volume models. We're able to get better pricing. Again, for profit vets could could start low cost, high volume models, and we've got partners that have. Um, and they've been really successful at that, and they can get that same pricing. And then the idea that we're stealing clients. So asking your clients if they've ever been to a vet before and sharing the results of that information with um, the the other clinics in your area, if there are clinics in you know relatively close to where you're planning on having your services, just share the community assessment data that you've gathered that shows that most of the people in the community that you serve have never been to a vet before, that none of their pets have ever been to a vet before. And, and, you know, put it out there that you're trying to create new veterinary service seekers, not take them away. Um, we can also really sort of maximize our, our impact with the vet community by mapping out a 20 minute drive of our service area and going and in person to introduce ourselves. Um, I know a lot of us in animal welfare have uh, a fear of confrontation and maybe of, of tricky conversations with other humans. And it'd be a lot more fun to spend our time just talking to the animals. But ultimately, if we're going to be really successful in helping animals, we actually have to start focusing on people. And part of that is helping is, is focusing on private practice vets. Um, so when we open new clinics or when we're thinking about opening new clinics, we actually go to any vet within a 20 minute drive. We bring cookies. Our chief medical officer goes. Um, if you have a vet that can go, that's ideal. If your vet doesn't want to do it alone, then you can go with them. But you go and you talk to them about the services that you offer, you talk to them about the research that you've done, about how you've gotten where you are, and you tell them you're looking for a partner on this, this, or this. The things that you um, are not sure how to offer, the things that you can't afford to offer, um, you know, will they see emergency situations for you? Um, will they do heartworm treatments for you uh, if you're doing, and accept your heartworm tests if they come back positive? Um, you know, really just trying to work with them to, to expand, expand the conversation so that they can be helpful to you and you can be helpful to them. Um, always introduce yourself to, your front, to their front desk staff and their office manager because those are the ones that actually handle all the referrals at their clinics. 
Uh, and oftentimes they'll be excited about having, an, uh, having a low cost option to refer people to. All right, so service tiers. Um, at Emancipet, we've broken our, tour, our services into three different tiers. Everything in tier one is what I mean when I say um, healthy pet services. So core vaccines, um, ID and microchip, microchips, testing, um, antiparasitics, basic maintenance like nail trims and anal gland expression. These are things that you can offer pretty easily, especially if you already have a facility of some kind. All it really requires um, is an exam room or two. Or two for our clinics that are high volume, we need a minimum of two exam rooms. Some of our locations have as many as four. Um, the the slower clinics that we have see 50 uh, animals a day for high volume healthy pet services. The busier ones that we see uh, see up to 200 a day. Um, we run that with uh, one vet and anywhere from two to five technicians, depending on the volume. So that's a lot of animals that, that we're seeing in these communities and, and we're basically just providing these core things. Tier two, uh, we only offer tier two services at one of our locations currently, but we are sort of looking at slowly adding in more options. Tier two would be heartworm treatment, ear infections, skin infections, simple GI issues. Um, you can kind of see the list. And then tier three gets into sort of more um, chronic issues long-term care, um, uh, emergency care, any and all of these things I think are relevant to the idea of, of should we be offering new services in these communities. I think it just depends on the mission of your organization um, and the resources that you have. I, I personally think that at the very least we should be starting with these healthy pet services, but I think if you have the ability the space, the drive, the mission, and the staff to do any one of these other things or all of them, as long as you can do it in a way that's transparent, um, and as long as there's a real need and you're not just needlessly creating a service that's actually your that you would be duplicating in the community that's already available at a low cost, then I think that you should go for it. Um, one of the things that's been really key for us in having these services and realizing that the clients who are bringing their pets to us haven't been to the pet vet before is really focusing on just one or two or three issues that we're going to talk to them about with their pet. So that means there might be six things that we can see pretty easily in a quick exam that are that are need attention, but we're probably going to pick like the two things that seem the most important to us. So maybe flea control and getting the dog's weight up as an example. Um, it could be a variety of things, but in general, um, when we're seeing animals for healthy pet services, we're not seeing animals that are super sick. Um, we don't have the bandit width to do that. We're really like seeing animals that are uh, healthy for the standard of their community, which might mean they're overweight, it might mean they're underweight, it's just they're gonna look like what the other animals in that community look like. And we're gonna try and keep the visit um, very easy to digest for the pet owner. We're not gonna try to um, set set standards that they can't meet we're gonna we're gonna give them an easy pathway to picking one or two things that they can do to make their pet a little bit happier and make their relationship with their pet a little bit stronger and hopefully over time they'll bring the pet back but really we have to think about this as maximizing a single visit we might only have our pet our, our hands on this animal once so what can we do to make sure that that's as impactful as possible for that animal um, and transformative in a positive way as possible for that pet owner. Um, streamlining the, the uh, actual items that you keep in your clinic. So uh, our, our chief medical officer likes to say that we've been otoscope free since uh, 1999. The idea is that if we don't have um, equipment or tools on hand to treat or diagnose things that we don't treat or diagnose, then our vets and our technicians won't be tempted to do it. Um, so don't, you know, somebody might want to donate an x-ray machine to your organization, but if you don't plan on offering x-rays to the general public and having that in your services, you might not want to accept it. Um, you might want to really just focus on having the bare essentials to do the services that you do um, both because that takes some of the pressure off of your staff to feel like they're making a decision to turn somebody away that they could have helped because they had some piece of equipment laying around. And also because one of the problems that you see 
with programs like this that mean well initially is this sort of mission creep where staff do have access to more things or you have a vet that's happy to do some amputations here and there even though that's not a service that you offer and going back to the private practice veterinarians and thinking about um, their experience with you and whether or not they have any right to be mad at you as long as you do what you say you're going to do uh, they don't have any they don't have any right to be mad at you but as soon as you start kind of doing the, the occasional mass removal through the back door providing you know um, euthanasia services that you don't offer to the public um, at a low cost to somebody who has turned away at a local vet once you start doing that stuff it's going to get out and it's going to get back to those private practice vets and then they actually are going to kind of be well founded in being mad at you and in stirring up um, it, it, resentment and anger in the veterinary community towards you so just be conscious of what you have on hand when you're designing a program or a healthy pet clinic, um, really don't don't worry about buying stuff that you might need. Uh, really focus on the stuff that you know you're gonna need. Um, and again, this is a really big section that we could talk about forever, but I'm gonna keep us moving. All right, so how much to charge? At Amanta Pet, we have three bottom lines. Everything that we do, every program that we um, that we launch, Every, every product that we sir, um, sell, every, um, every staff position that we hire, every, everything that we do has to meet all three of these. And if it doesn't meet all three of these, then we can't do it. So it has to be financially sustainable, uh, meaning that, that we, we cannot lose money hand over fist on something unless we have a, an identified constant and ongoing funding stream for that. Um, it needs to be. Uh, tr it needs to provide a transformative uh, service or experience for our clients, um, our staff, our donors, our, our everyone involved. So that means that it needs to be some. The, the experience of receiving care needs to be so good that the client leaves different than they came in. They leave be believing that 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 uh, they should always seek out that service in the future because the experience was so good. And then it needs to be quality medicine. So we never would cut corners um, on the medicine that we provide uh, in order to make something work. So that can be a really challenging standard to set, but it's helpful to us in a variety of ways. One of the ways it's helpful to us is because it gives us a lens through which we can explain how we do what we do to our staff um, and, and, why, and why it's so important that we fundraise and that we um, that we partner and that, uh, you know, that we don't offer things for free as a one-off unless we have a long-term 100% um, commitment on funding for it so that we can continue to offer it um, in the community that we're serving. Um, in order to be a strong organization uh, and create social change, we have to be here for the long haul, which means that we have to be thoughtful about what we offer and how it impacts our finances. Um, again, so that's sort of the lens of, of financial uh, sustainability. When it comes to transformative service, um, we this means more than just great customer service. We want our clients to be transformed by each and every client service interaction with us. So teaching our staff about social change and helping them really understand what's at stake anytime a person comes to us for a rabies vaccine or for an FBRCP vaccine or for a nail trim. That, that it's not just a transaction, it's, it's a transformation. It's an opportunity to reach out and touch the lives of this pet and their person and, and have them want to seek us out again and again and again in the future. Um, our goal is to move people along a, tra a trajectory from non-service seekers to having all of their preventatives, spay and neuter, and coming to us for annual exams of their own accord. This takes time and trust, um, and it's and it's built over many many transformative experience for our clients and then practicing quality medicine it's incredibly important to us that we don't cut corners for efficiency or financial reasons at our clinics in simplest terms if this means that if we absolutely need need a piece of equipment to do something right and there is no alternative we either buy it or we don't offer that service because we're high volume low cost and nonprofit this is something that comes up frequently it's especially uh, when it comes to adding new services um so yeah so we you know part of the reason that we have not taken on the the challenge of adding a 
grooming service in Houston yet, which I, we've continued to talk about. But part of the reason we haven't done it is because we haven't been able to tackle uh, making it financially sustainable, transformative for our clients, and, and of the quality that we would require for it to have the Emancipat stamp of approval. So how much do we charge? All of the, what you charge has to meet your bottom lines. You have to have bottom lines for what you want your experience to be for the pets that come to you, for the clients that come to you, um, for the staff that work for you, and on, and on the finances of the organization. And those are going to feed into um, those are going to feed into your your pricing model. Uh, I'm showing you this because I think it's a tool that you can use to test the the feasibility of pricing as you move into budgeting for your services. This is just an example of what our services are um, at our healthy pet clinics at Emancipet. Uh, we charge um, just $69 for spay, neuter, dog, or cat. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out about that is that it's completely transparent pricing. So if somebody brings an animal to us for spay or neuter, um, we say it's $69 and that's how much it is, regardless of whether or not that animal was in heat or pregnant. Um, we've moved recently towards this model of not having any kind of add-on things that we warn them about, but that could kind of feel like a bait and switch later on. Because again, we're working with, with populations of people that haven't had experiences with a vet before. And we really wanna make sure that the experience is, is transformative in the good way and not the bad way. Um, you can see our prices kind of across the board. We charge $5. Um, as an office visit fee. So it's basically $5 to come to us for wellness services or for healthy pet services. And then each other service is, um, is an a la carte service. We want people to be engaged in the process of selecting what their pet needs and working within their budget. The technician will help them. If they say we have, they have $50 today, um, then we'll say, okay, well, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? With the money that you have, these are the three things that we recommend that you get. Um, I noticed that you your your animal doesn't have a collar, doesn't have a tag. I know that you don't have enough leftover money to get those things, but we can actually give you those. Um, we can discount the five dollar exam fee. The the staff has a lot of flexibility in order to make sure that that clients that come to us are leaving with the most possible um, services that we can get them. Because really, the more thing, the more products that they leave with, that the healthier their pet will be. Uh, um, all right, this is a tool that I'm showing you guys for sort of making a to-do list of how to decide what you're going to do. So you can have a brick and mortar facility, you can have a mobile clinic. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about this stuff. And so as you look at this list, um, you, you can make, you can kind of make this same sort of grid for yourself. Um, along the left-hand side is, is our considerations that you need to think about before you start your clinic. And along the top are stakeholders that, um, that might be involved with that. So, click the, so for clinic loca location, um, your board, your mission, and your philosophy are all going to be involved in that. Your funds and your budget are obvi obviously going to be involved. Um, you're going to need to do community assessment. Uh, your facilities and assets are going to uh, have some role in that, and your state laws are going to have some role in that. Um, there's probably very little preference involved in where your clinic goes. Uh, mobile versus stationary, it's kind of all the same things. Your hours and days of operation, that's going to depend on your budget, how many staff you can afford to have. Um, and it's really going to depend in a major way on your community assessment, right? because you're gonna have worked with the community that you wanna to serve to determine when they're available to go to the vet, when they're available to take the day off of work. Um, so you just kind of, this is just a, a helpful tool that you can use um, to, to figure things out. Um, I've, the hours and days things, just as an example, I think I've, far too often I've seen programs that are offering stuff uh, once every month. That's a pretty narrow window of time people you know may not be able to get to that consistently that takes a lot of planning and if we're talking about a community that's living check to check and would have to take a day off of work and potentially borrow a car from somebody to get to you having only one day that they can do it every month um, might not be enough also only being open between you know 10 a.m and 4 p.m a lot of people work during the day so you know being open later till 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 p.m can be really instrumental 
and then obviously being open on the weekends. So just thinking through each one of these things, um, talking to your stakeholders, making sure that you're setting yourself up for success. Um, all right. So staff training. This is a what the sort of one of the final and most important pieces of doing this work. Um, you really want to train your staff about the importance of social change and non-judgment. Um, all of the research that you do to learn about the community that you serve, you want to share that information with your staff so they understand the long-standing barriers to service and messaging that exist in your community, that they understand why uh, your mission is to provide these services in this community um, and how and how you're trying to create a transformation in behavior of a group of people, which means touching every individual that comes in very personally, very caringly, um, and hopefully creating these transformations. At Emancipet, it also means that we train our staff in uh, low stress handling. We use Sophia Yin's materials, and we, we actually have trainings on each and every um, one of the different activities that staff will participate in and in the different roles that they have. They're broken into small little sections, and one of them is low stress restraints and low stress handling, um, animal behavior in general. And then hierarchy of treatment needs. So we need to make sure that we're training our staff to work with individuals um, and that we're giving them the tools that they need to make sure that they can be really successful in, creeping, in creating a pain-free experience for your clients. This kind of goes back to the example that I gave about, you know, we charge $5 for healthy pet services. All of our staff know that if somebody's got very little money, the first thing that they can do without asking for permission from a manager is discounting the, the office visit fee. They can take that $5 off uh, all on their own without any permission needed. Um, they also then need to understand, like, what is the most important thing that this pet leaves with today? What are the most endemic diseases in the pet community that we serve? And how can I make sure that I'm setting up this pet for success and for long life and health when they go home? So really working with your staff to understand, like, if somebody has $15, this is, you know, these are the things sort of in order of need of whether or not they have them that you need to make sure that they get. And then active listening. Um, one of the one of my favorite things, uh, one of my favorite ideas is that um, the 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 act of curiosity and listening quiet the judging mind. So when we talk about wanting to be judgmental or wanting to be non-judgmental, one of the ways that we do that is by being really really super curious and working to be super curious and working to really listen intently. To the people that we serve and listen to what they have to say, um, ask great questions, let them tell you stories, really connect with them. Um, so in order to train our staff like on this, we have, uh, we have training passports that uh, go into um, all of the things that the staff need to learn in their first month of working at Emancipet. They get um, tested on all of these things. This is everybody at Emancipet gets tra trained on um, sort of the state of, of animal welfare now, who we are as an, an, orga as an organization, um, what high quality veterinary medicine means at Emancipet, transformative customer service, culture of philanthropy, why it's important that we all ask for donations um, when, you know, when we're talking to people in the world, sustainable finance and safety training. Our healthy pet clinics uh, technicians will receive extensive training on our, our medical software. Um, our our um, uh, just what our services we offer and why, uh, clinic operations, venipuncture, um, customer service uh, policies, et cetera. One of the most important things um, at our clinics and at, at every location that we have is customer service. Customer service is a tool for creating social change by sharing transformative messages and creating personal experiences for all of our customers. I also think that customer service can kind of just save the world. Everyone loves receiving great customer service. What if we all approached our interactions with each other in life through the lens of trying to provide a great customer service experience to one another? And I don't just mean the clients at our clinics. I mean our coworkers, our donors, our stakeholders. I mean each other at conferences. I mean our fellow organizations in the community. Uh, it's really hard to be unhappy when you're receiving great customer service. And if everyone is doing it for each other all the time, um, then we sort of stand to elevate our communities and our, and our programs and our organizations. 
So it's one of the most important things at Emancipat, and it's one of the things that we spend the most time on. I'm going to give you guys two customer service rules that we believe in wholeheartedly that are at the basics uh, of, of providing a great experience. Number one is the 10-4 rule. If another human being is within 10 feet of an Emancipat employee, no matter what their job is, from CEO um, to, to director of finance to clinic manager to recovery technician, if another person is within 10 feet of you, you must make eye contact and smile. And if they're in an, within another four feet of you, you must make eye contact, smile, and uh, verbally acknowledge them in some way. So this means that when you're walking through the waiting room of an Emancipat clinic, the Emancipat staff, every single person that you walk past is going to look up, smile at you, and say hi, or say, oh my God, that is the cutest puppy that I have seen yet, or say, I love your shirt, whatever it is. We're all going to do that to each other. And while it sounds a little bit crazy and it sounds like kind of high maintenance, it also makes it really hard for your staff to have a bad day. And it makes it really hard for a client to have a bad experience because we've all had the experience of sitting in the waiting room of a shelter or of a clinic and, and having the vet walk by with their head down because the last thing they want to do is get caught stuck into or get stuck um, talking to a client. The other rule is responding for customer complaints. The first rule, and we train all of our staff on this, so the first piece of this is acknowledging the emotion that the person is experiencing. You're frustrated. Um, you do this through um, active listening, the first two steps. So you, you first of all say, you know, I can see that you're frustrated. Please tell me um, what's happening. Uh, next, there you're going to repeat back what you've heard through active listening. You know, it sounds to me like you came today thinking that you were going to be able to get a rabies vaccine for your kitten, and now you're being told that your kitten's actually a couple weeks too young to receive it. Am I getting that right? And then you're going to say, I'm so sorry that you had this experience and that you were given, that you were given inaccurate uh, information. Next, you're going to solve the problem. Now, in that example that I just gave, there's a variety of ways you could do that. If you have an outreach program, you could say, you know, uh, we, ha we do have somebody that comes to your neighborhood um, frequently. We could potentially bring your cat back in for a rabies vaccine in a couple weeks if you're not able to make it. Um, or you could say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's a voucher for a free rabies vaccine and a free FBRCP booster for when you, when you come back. Um, you know, we totally understand that this was inconvenient for you and we want to make sure that you feel 100% good about coming back, whatever it is, solve the problem. Oftentimes, just doing the first two things is all you can do to solve the problem. Uh, but if you can solve it, certainly do. And then finally, we say thank you so much for letting us know where we let you down and giving us the opportunity to try and fix it. Um, we want people to walk away from any kind of frustrating experience with us, kind of blown away by how hard we worked to make them feel really good and really right at the end of that experience. And the reason that we want that is because ultimately our foundation, our foundational belief is at Emancipet is that we believe that people love their pets and will do what's best for them given the chance. We spend a lot of time in animal welfare talking about communities that don't do things that we want them to do. And I think that we, we build a lot of judgment into that and, and sort of create the, the feeling that um, they maybe are quote unquote irresponsible pet owners or that they don't love their pets the way that we do because it looks different. The reality is that people are doing the best that they can. People are caring for their pets to the standard of their community. And most people really, really do love their pets. And we stand to reach those people by believing that every single person that's in front of us loves their pet and is doing the best that they can. All right. Um, I had intended to have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I am ready for questions if there are any. Yep, excellent. Miles, thank you so much. Full of information, this is fantastic. So I've been moderating the questions while you've been awesome. chatting. And I closed so, it down so they wouldn't distract me. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, it's very tough. So. Uh, I just, you touched upon this, but I would like to sort of reiterate it. There are a couple of questions that came through. Um, you had talked about, you know, the tiers and only handling what your uh, practice can handle. Lots of concerns about if a cat comes in, 
that is sick or what if, you know, if there's, uh, you know, extra circumstances, sometimes you get surprises that walk through the door. Sure. How do you, how do you handle those situations with like sick animals? You're not turning them away. So, so how do you handle that? So that's a great question. So um, one, one of the first pieces of that is making sure that the outreach that you're doing in the community, be it through your website, um, through actual door-to-door -door community engagement, um, through you know radio advertising, whatever it is, like whatever you're putting out in the world, that it actually says what you offer, right? And that you're not that it's that it's specific enough, um, and that if you're not offering any care for sick or injured animals, that that that's pretty clear. Obviously, you're still going to have people that show up um, with sick or injured animals sometimes, and that kind of comes back to the um, the piece that I mentioned about partnering with local veterinarians. So. In every community that we serve, we have partners who we can refer to, and we can't. We literally just can't fix everything. We can't treat everything. We're not a full service clinic right now. Um, we do have some programs that we're piloting that are more, you know, that are starting to treat. Uh, but in general, we don't want to set up uh, a standard at our clinics where every once in a while we try to help an animal that was hit by car or that needed a mass remove, because then what's the difference between that one and the next one? And, and it can create a lot of discord um, and resentment and sadness among your staff, not to mention among the veterinary community if you do. So you really do have to kind of have a hard line around what services you're gonna offer, and then you wanna look for partners that can help you with those other services. Um, in some communities, we have, we have more partners than others, but in general, I've found that most communities have at least one or two vets that maybe aren't as close as you to the community that you're serving, but who are willing to do things at a slightly lower cost and try to work with your clients. Great. It's, a, it's an olive branch for the veterinary community. Yeah. Do you happen to know of any data on uh, clinic impacts of uh, well, are not actually on the clinic impacts, but on the private practice impacts when a clinic moves into a community and offers low cost spay neuter vaccines, how does that impact the private practices sort of annual budget? That's a tough question to answer in that I think that every private practice has its own business model and there's a lot of there's a lot of different things that go into um, their success or failure. What we're seeing on the whole, is that sort of the, the, the traditional small private practice, we do a little bit of everything model, um, is no longer being sustainable for veterinarians um, and that many veterinarians are having to look at new models um, of, of success. I, I can tell you, we've been in Austin for 19 years and there's plenty of thriving full service uh, veterinary practices here. Um, so I, I have not seen any impact for better or for worse upon them, well, for worse upon them from us existing. The ones that we partner with, many of them have expanded staff and expanded hours because they decided to start offering some low cost care that we didn't offer. Um, one great example is there's, a, there's an organization here in Austin that started doing low cost dentals. Um, that was something that we didn't offer and we wanted to partner that we could refer people out to. Um, they're doing dentals for between 250 and $350. And uh, and so we we rep we started referring uh, people to them. We get our, our phones team gets over 700 calls a day, um, and a lot of those people are just looking for stuff that we don't offer. Since since we started referring stuff to them, they've opened three new locations and they've expanded their staff to seven days a week at all of their locations. They still can't keep up with the demand. So that's like a success story of. An, another vet benefiting from us being in the community and serving people that had ever never actually been to a vet before and then having a first conversation about maybe that their pet needed a dental um, and referring them over to those veterinarians. I have no I have no knowledge of any veterinarian that's been driven out of business um, by the by the work that we do. And in general, we're not opening up shop next door to other veterinarians. The communities that we serve um, don't have vets within, you know, within reasonable, uh, within reasonable access to the people that we serve. Right, right. Going back to that map that you had, where you were saying, yep. you know, exactly. in this area there was, there's no veterinarians there. They exactly. may be on the outskirts, but they're not in that general target area. 
Exactly. And there were two. So when we opened in Houston, there were two vets, one that had just opened. They had literally opened during the time that we were getting all our permitting for our clinic. Um, there was So there was that vet that opened relatively close to us. Um, there had not been any vets there before. And then there was one that was a little bit further away, kind of on the border. And of those two vets, the one that was a little bit further away um, was an 80-year-old vet. He had his clients. He wasn't looking for new clients. He could care less. We, we went and we met him and we were like, hey, like, do you, can we refer stuff to you? And he was like, no, like, I don't. He just he basically was like seeing his clients until he closes up. And the other new clinic, um, they said, you know, they were really excited that we were there, that there was going to be another another clinic in, in the area that would kind of start to drive um, people towards veterinary medicine. And they said that they were willing to take our heartworm test results uh, and offer heartworm treatment to people that came to our clinic. So they were happy to partner with us. And they're still there and they're still partners. They're still in business. Uh, my last question has to do with your pricing and mm -hmm. um, sort of the financials. So looking at what you were showing us with the pricing, and I know that's just for one clinic and it may not be mm -hmm. for everywhere. Um, the money that you derive from services, is that covering everything or how much fundraising do you have to do to fill the gap? That's a great question. Um, so keeping in mind that Emancipet does a lot of spay neuter as well as a lot of healthy pet services. So we, we're gonna do close to 40,000, we'll do for, close to 40,000 spay neuter surgeries this year. Um, and we'll see more than 100,000 healthy pet visits this year. So of, of all of those animals and people and visits, um, it, it all feeds into one larger budget. And most of our clinics, most of our individual clinics have both spay neuter and healthy pet services um, and to varying amounts. So all that being said, we are about a 70-30 split of fee for service being the 70% and 30% fundraised. Um, if you just look at our healthy pet services, and this is one of those things like pricing is going to affect this, staffing is going to affect this, volume is going to affect this. But in general, we need to see about 50 patients per day in order to break even. So we know that when we go into a new community, um, our goal is to get our healthy pet clinic seeing, uh, seeing a minimum of 50 patients per day as soon as possible. Because until it hits that, then we're underwriting that cost. Um, we 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 can do healthy pet services um, totally basically. I mean, we can do it so that the fee for service supports the cost of offering those services. Our spay neuter, we actually underwrite a portion of every spay neuter that we do in order to keep the prices as low as we can. So we actually they cost us more than we charge, and we just intentionally built it that way um, so that we could have very low pricing and we and also free programs, and we underwrite we underwrite the remaining amount through fundraising. Yeah, for my cat mobile, ours, our cost per cat was like around 85 or $90 per mm -hmm. cat, somewhere in that ballpark. Well, yeah, and mobile, yeah, of course, mobile. As, as we both know, mobile is a lot more expensive. And uh, yeah, yeah, and then so we, were, we would use things to try, we charged only $35 for the feral, so we were always trying to yeah. Monkey around with things to be able to get the feral cats at 35, which still, if you're doing 10 cats, that's 350 bucks. So yes. we're still, um, you know, sort of swimming against the tide when it comes to that very, very, that population that needs really the free or the very low cost bay neuter. Yes. There's still a lot of work that has to happen there. Do you have any sort of comments on on that component, on that group or population of cats that that we do need to address? Um, well, so I, well, sorry, you, you're, what you were saying made one thing pop sorry. into my head that I wanted to say, and then, and then, and then, <laughs> then I went another separate way. question, <laughs> um, then you went another way. But so like, let me say the first thing, and then I want you to ask me that question again, but very quickly, I want to say when it comes to offering these services, if you want to build a program that, that treats, uh, both owned animals and, um, and community cats. I think, I, I mean, I'm assuming that anybody that's working with community cat populations that this would be a no-brainer. Um, but just, let's just say for, for the sake of argument, um, you would wanna build space that is separate and away from sort of everything else for those community cats to come in. You might wanna have a separate door. You might wanna have a separate space. You're gonna wanna have, you know, 
you're going to want to have a lot of uh, of of a, a quiet and calm space to receive those clients. But I think it could be. It's not part of our mission to to uh, to really target community cats because our our mission is focused on owned animals. Um, but I always get excited about the idea of building programs that really focus on community cats, and that would be a, an important piece of it. Now, ask me the question that you just asked me again. <laughs> Uh, well, I was just talking about you sort of clarified that they're just saying, you know, we're focusing on owned. And, and I think mm -hmm. that that you may have an, a vision of owned as a much more black and white thing than I do when you say the word mm. owned cat, because mm -hmm. I think a community cat can be an owned cat. Sure. Um, and so, you know, it, well, you know, I think you can serve both audiences or you know, so to speak however both audiences the owned cat versus the community cat cannot afford the price tag so right. that's where some of that fundraising comes into play i would assume yeah, to subsidize absolutely. those costs and it, i think i guess what i'm saying is like that for the community cat that that is like you know maybe a cat that lives in a neighborhood if there's an individual that will bring it to the clinic then as far as I'm concerned, it's it's owned. You know what I mean? I guess yep. I guess really the delineation would be sort of bet more between like community cat and like a truly feral cat that's like coming in in a trap versus yep. a cat that's like a friendly cat that lives in the community or a you know somewhat social cat. Basically my cat that lives in my house that is barely not feral. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so so that there so those those we would still have resources for those people, and we we generally um, try to build our programs in such a way that we can be flexible with people's finances. We really never want to turn people away uh, for financial reasons, so we always try to work with people as much as we can. And 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 then going back to what you said, we have a broad base of of fundraising. So we, the best practice that we sort of recommend is we don't rely solely on grants, we don't rely solely on uh, individual uh, donors, and we don't re rely solely on client donations. We rely on all of those things and so that we have a broad base of support financially so that we can continue to grow and offer services at a low cost and offer, and offer services for free. Yep. Sounds great. Well, Miles, I want to thank you so very much for presenting today. This was excellent information.